<rire> Hello everyone, bonjour à toutes et à tous, j'espère que vous allez bien, j'espère que vous nous entendez bien, que vous nous recevez bien. Je suis Franck Payen, je vais être avec vous pendant euh, 90 minutes, peut-être un peu plus, un peu moins, avec euh, Patrick O'Keefe. Bonjour Patrick. Bonjour. Il parle super bien français, mais all the session will happen in English. So, sorry for our French audience, today is going to be an English only session. And uh, you're going to have to wait for Google to translate our YouTube session. Uh, on est donc, comme d'habitude, sur la chaîne YouTube Adobe France. Vous pouvez évidemment vous abonner. Vous pouvez liker dès maintenant, surtout si vous aimez bien Spider-Man, Spider-Verse et tous les films qui y sont associés. Vous verrez, je vous ai fait un petit sondage aussi pour ceux qui ne sont pas tout le temps là et qui aimeraient bien le lire. Je vous ai demandé si vous aviez vu les films Spider-Man, Spider-Verse. Euh, si vous aviez vu juste le premier, juste le deuxième, ou si vous ne voyez même pas de quoi on est en train de parler, c'est le moment de répondre au sondage. Et, euh, ok, je switch en anglais à partir de maintenant. So, à, à bientôt les Français. Uh, let's go back to English. So, I'm sure you understand me. <laughs> I got sure it all, yeah. Everybody understands you, me, and everyone. And that's going to be a very nice session. Uh, Patrick, can you introduce yourself in a few words, maybe <coughs> without an image first? Without an image, who am I? Um, I, I I'm Patrick O'Keefe. I'm a Toronto-born, LA-based illustrator, art director, recently production designer of Spider-Man uh, Across the Spider-Verse. Um, I've been an artist sort of my entire life. I just picked up a pencil at a young age, probably the one my brother stuck in my hand, and fell in love with it. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and it's all I ever really wanted to do. And as we were discussing earlier today, it's kind of the only thing I do know how to do. <laughs> um, I'm fortunate enough to be here in Adobe Paris and uh, hanging out and I've had a great time and we're going to talk a little bit about my career, um, what my interests are and then um, and then do a little demo, uh, show you how I sort of approach painting and what I do with my time away from Spider-Verse. <clears throat> does it happen, like time away from Spider-Verse? It does. I'm on a very much needed, much enjoyed six month hiatus between films. This, this is the most time. I've ever had off in my entire life not working. Uh, and a lot of people were asking me, how am I going to stop working? Uh, easily. <laughs> easily. I very much enjoyed sitting on the couch with my cats for about four weeks straight. Oh, yeah. my. I yeah. didn't think it would happen. And, uh, well, sorry to put you back in front of your... Oh, uh, no, your it's okay. Room. I'll be a little rusty, but that's all right. It's good practice. Yeah. <laughs> so I will stop by to say hello to Imaginary, to Nikki, to Delphine, to Nayan, Natalia. Natalia is already asking for a demo. Okay, okay wait good. Wait a second. It's coming, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, we're com completely coming for that. Uh, Mathilde, uh, Gérald, Emma, Smash OD1, Cédric, <laughs> ex-Toronto fan. Ex-Toronto fan. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's an ex Toronto? I don't know an ex. I mean, most people from Toronto, I think, I believe, are ex Toronto sports fans. <laughs> Our hockey team is always terrible. It's easy to, it's easy to not not support them. Okay, and uh, <laughs> KYD fourteen twelve says hi. I cannot wait for this evening. So yeah. By the way, today we're receiving Patrick, uh, especially for an English only session. And uh, that session is doubled with uh, Yamag uh, masterclass session, which is happening this evening. I'm so sorry for people who are discovering it just right now, but tickets have been sold out for a couple of days now. And uh, you will have to maybe follow more of uh, Yamag next time you want to come with us. You will need to, to realize that they've got a very nice live program for next year's masterclass. It's it's going to be very different, but I'm sure you can find some things you like to see, something you like to watch. And I'm just going to send you a small link to today's venue, today's information. Oh, X is your username. Oh, maybe we've got, oh. we've got Elon Musk with us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm giving you the IMAG session uh, for today. Sorry for the ones who didn't get a ticket. Tickets are sold out. But maybe if you if you're nice enough, if mm. you get a nice enough crowd, mm. and if you're if you're in Paris and you really can come, I'm gonna make a very small contest to maybe grab one last ticket for tonight's venue. Oh, we got one ticket. Just one. One ticket. Okay. It, it, it's just one seat. I know it's a huge room, but it's already crowded. So one ticket and it's going to happen somewhere in the middle of the session. 
Hello, MD O'Keefe. Do, oh, do we know MD That O'Keefe? is my dad. Hello, dad. I think all of uh, North America is asleep, but he lives in Newfoundland, which has it's on a wacky time zone in the middle of the Atlantic. So he's the only one of my family and friends <laughs> in North America that's up right now. <clears throat> well, uh, enough words. Maybe I can mm-hmm. share your screen. Um, <laughs> ready to tell us your story? Sure. Okay. So, you. so as I said, I'm uh, Patrick O'Keefe from a Toronto-based, L- uh, sorry, Toronto-born. We can redo that, right? We're not yeah, live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let, let's get let's start again. <laughs> uh, Toronto-born, LA-based artist. I've worked in uh, advertising, comic books, video games. I did a long stint in video games, uh, but really wanted to make film. About seven years ago, when I moved to the United States, I got my green card, moved, to, moved uh, packed my bags up, put my cats in one bag, my clothes, the few clothes I had in another bag, and drove down to Los Angeles um, and j- tried to make a jump into the film world. I was lucky enough to get a, get a job with Sony Pictures Animation, which then eventually led to working on the Spider-Verse film, the first Spider-Verse film, Into the Spider-Verse as a visual development artist. Um, I was just so excited, so interested in the subject. I wanted to know everything and be involved in every single part of the filmmaking. And I was rewarded with the uh, promotion to an art director position on the first Spider-Man film. And what I really wanted to do was become a production designer. That's for those that don't know, the production designer is the head of the entire sort of art department and is charged with the overall look and feel of the the visuals of the entire film. Um, it's an absolute dream job of mine, and I managed to get there for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Um, but before any of that, actually, I got started as a graffiti artist. When um, when I was 15, actually, the same day that the I got a, my first paying job mm. from the Canada Arts Council to go to Newfoundland, where my dad's at, um, to work with troubled youth, uh, was the same day that the police showed up at my house to let my mother know that as an underage teen, I'd been arrested and needed to show up to court for doing graffiti. Um, but I was on my way and had a, had a good gig. Um, as I said, I then went to school, worked in many different parts of the industry, uh, commercial work, comic books, all that stuff, eventually became the art director in the Spider-Verse. And I think the reason everybody's coming to my talk tonight, what we're gonna get into very deeply, is um, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, the new Spider-Man film that came out this summer. Um, What I love about this film, and we'll be diving in deep tonight and touching on a little bit today is, as an artist in art school, I always got in trouble. I, I have a history of getting in trouble, but I always got in trouble for my professors for never having one distinct style. Uh, I just love art. I love every aspect of art, just graffiti, painting, sketching, technical design. Uh, I could never sort of narrow my focus into one one specific style. And as I was studying illustration, that's really what they what they want. They're like, you're gonna be, you know, the guy who does these types of posters or, or movie concert, tickets or whatever uh the covers of the atlantic or you know the the new york post but i never had one style and uh what made it such a comfortable fit for for the spider-verse then is style is not something we we assign liberally to or 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 predetermine just going into the movie the sony pictures has no house style um the spider-verse doesn't really have its uh a native style what we look for is style is a tool it's a tool we're going to use to tell stories however we want so uh in this example here we're looking at the world of 2099 um earth 928 i believe in spider-man lingo and you know we wanted to go for this really sid me john Berkey industrial designer style approach um when it, <clears throat> do, do, do you have when you're working on that production you have to know what every version of a spider verse is by its number or everybody um, knows it or not i try to but i usually keep a cheat sheet sort of right <laughs> behind my zoom camera so i always sound intelligent um but you get to know that there's a lot of acronyms you need to know mm-hmm. while making a film every sequence has an acronym the film itself has different acronyms um, so style, style is a tool. Uh, when it comes to something like Gwen's world, you know, this is a totally different style than say that Earth uh, 928, 2099 style. This is a much more fluid style. Thinking about Gwen as a character, what does her character look like on film? And we look a lot at the comic books, but what really stood out to us is there's an emotionality 
in Gwen that is extremely fluid. She, you know, she's a teenager. Um, I think as teenagers, we're all sort of this roiling stew of emotion that's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to lean into in her world going into these like very wet into wet materials. It would allow for this sort of emotion of emotional fluidity to to be right on screen. Then, you know, we've got somebody quite different, Spider-Punk. Spider-Punk, he comes from the world of Old York. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mashup between London and New York. And we really wanted him to be like an homage to all these incredible punk posters um, and zines from the time. So instead of just doing traditional sort of 2D CG illustration, we actually took punk posters, photographs, other illustrations we've done, cut them up, Xerox them, tape them back together, much like you were making a, a zine for a punk you know, poster. Uh -huh. And it's that sort of approach, returning to the artist materials um, and, and the era and the approach and, and directionality of that era that we put in every single piece of artwork. And that helps us determine the styles, you know? And again, I never liked or had the ability to really pin down a style when I was a student. And so this film has been such a great place for me because it never wants to be the same thing twice. <laughs> Every universe has its own style, so you don't have to be your, you don't have to get that Patrick style you never found. Yes, inconsistency is the only consistency. <laughs> um, when I'm doing a lot of this work, again, we're exploring all these different styles, but it all comes from a place of knowing how to draw and paint. Um, and that's the big focus that we'll kind of talk on a bit today is not just different styles, but um, an approach to drawing and painting that I think has served me really well. And I, I kind of encourage with a lot of the students I work. Um, as we just sort of flip through some of this artwork, you'll see that even though I'm going for different styles, um, it's the, the materiality all has a stylization, but is referencing a real style of materials. The lighting has a sense of realism. Um, and I really encourage all the artists I work with, can you paint, you know, somewhat photo real mm -hmm. and, and develop your drawing and painting skills, not so worried about on your, uh, what your stylistic approach is always going to be. That's the cool creative part, but we need to work on our kind of our art muscles here and just become better at drawing and painting and understanding the world around us. Mm -hmm. um, that enables me then to just whip out these paintings, two, three of them a day, um, because I have an understanding, a foundation of drawing and painting skills. So I encourage everybody to do lots and lots of studies as, as they are working on discovering who they are as an artist. Something we were talking about at lunch, because uh, we just ate, before, it's, it's lunchtime in Paris, is um, people paying attention. I, I always encourage people, pay attention to the things you pay attention to. You know, don't just walk through the world no, seeing things you enjoy and then walking past them. but uh, those photographs you're always taking, those artists you're following, those songs that you're listening to, question and ask yourself, why do I like these things? What is it about I, these things I like? That'll help you understand who you are. It's also a great way of just exploring the world. And if you then take that approach with doing these painting studies, we're going to dive into in a moment. Um, it can really help not only build your portfolio, but those art muscles we're talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Just is one it, more cool piece. Yeah. Is, is it important for a uh, graphic designer or an artist like you are that draws a lot to take pictures to take memories to do you do you draw from memory or do you take pictures and draw with your pictures next to it i kind of do it all um i i i don't really want to limit my approach in any way so mm -hmm. i take a lot of photos i've been on vacation now traveling around europe for a few weeks taking thousands of photos everywhere i go um sitting down with my sketchbook in cafes that's why mm -hmm. i love paris you can turn anywhere and it basically draws itself. It's such a beautiful city. Excuse me. Um, so sitting there drawing from life, drawing from memory, uh, and, and then taking photos and doing studies is something I really encourage. And that's sort of the point I wanted to get to is a lot of young artists I run into uh, are, or artists that are early in their art career and their pursuit. Um, hey, I'm just a floating head now. <laughs> I, knew, I knew I should have wore black. Um, I, I told you, and you cannot change the background. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, this idea of, I find a lot of artists sort of run into this wall where they want to make some art. They get home after work, they're working their art, regular art job or their non-art regular, non regular job. 
And um, they want to create and yet they're stuck. They don't know what to create. There's a lack of inspiration. And at a young age, I realized I needed to separate inspiration from motivation. I have the motivation to want to draw and paint. And yet I'm not inspired necessarily to draw and paint. And so one thing I did was by separating the two, focus on doing um, studies. Mm -hmm. And these are the photo studies I'm talking about um, and keeping just a big folder of things I'd like to paint that will get me motivated to paint when I come home and I have that energy to paint. It's the end of the day, but I'm not ready to go to bed. I'll just do a quick painting um, of something I've seen, something I've experienced, something I found interesting. It's not about making a gorgeous piece of art necessarily, but more building those art skills. And, and for me, a way of remembering where I've been, what I saw and, and learning about the skills and improving the skills I have. So what I have here is sort of a collection of, um, pieces from travels throughout the year. Um, I didn't get to travel a lot as a kid. So now as an adult, I travel, I get, I try to take every opportunity I can to travel. And, um, Art is drawing is sort of the way I always experience the world. And now that I'm traveling through it, that's where I put my focus is, 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 is interpreting the world the way I see it. So these two are from a trip through uh, Costa Rica and Nicaragua, um, grabbing tons of photos, just doing sketches. And then when I have time getting back to a computer or acrylics, whatever it, it might be, um, watercolors. And just sitting down and doing a study again, it helps me relive the space mm -hmm. um, and understand the space, the qualities of lighting, the different materials I find all over the world. Uh, it's also, you know, what do I find interesting starts to become apparent to me, but it's more so than anything. It's just teaching me how to draw and paint better. Mm -hmm. I'm just practicing. I think that's the biggest thing we get. I get a question all the time. How do you get to that level? It's practice. It's practice. it's only, only practice. You draw you, you do you like do you give a uh, special schedule for drawing on? No, not really. I just I, there was a time in which I was like, I have to do one a day. And then mm -hmm. it just sort of became natural to do one a day. Mm -hmm. And then I find when I'm traveling, especially alone, I have a lot of free, lonely time. And so that's a perfect time to take out a sketchbook and start doodling uh, the world around me. So sometimes it's these cool landscapes. Sometimes it's just the things I'm seeing that I find fascinating. I find um, lighting, kind of awkward lighting situations and, and, um, varieties and materials very interesting and challenging and something i know i always want to get better at so this was like it from 4 a.m one night after partying in los angeles moving there and we were eating pastrami sandwiches and i was just sort of taken aback by the neon the way the neon lights are it's very la uh and and the the old school um jukebox here and the the repetition of pattern and odd colors and the, the the porcelain and the fluorescent lights work. These things just really fascinated me. They're not, you know, this isn't going to hang on a wall and mm -hmm. some famous gallery one day, but it's just a study and it helps me understand the world. So when I am charged with doing a spider verse or something yeah. like that, um, I know how to draw and paint. Mm. Again, I just sort of draw the things I see in life. <laughs> uh, this toilet painting actually got somewhat famous, which was pretty funny. Um, to me because it's very, it's my Marcel Duchamp moment, I guess. Um, the low art becomes the high art. But again, it's just the things I see and the experiences I have. One thing, when I first moved to America, I actually moved to San Francisco mm -hmm. and uh, I was going across the Golden Gate Bridge and was sort of taken aback by the scale of it all. And I really wanted to just capture that. Again, it's like, it's almost like a journal. It's not really for the general public unfortunately you know except mm -hmm. the fact we're doing it showing it to the general public now but again it's just for me to understand the world around me and the materials and one thing a lot of people from san francisco would comment on this is oh you captured the fact that the bridge itself needs a paint job right <laughs> and i guess they've seen it so often that they don't really recognize that but for me it's those little details those inconsistencies the 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 grit and the grime of things that's what mm -hmm. i'm really attracted to <laughs> Um, San Francisco is traditionally seen as this, like, it's California, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be nice and sunny. It's not. It's the, foggy. It's foggy. It's cold they, around it, Pacific. It's cold. Uh, they've even named the fog. The, the fog has a name, oh. Car Carl the Fog, because he that. shows up all the time. They, they had to give him a name. Um, and I wanted to capture 
a version of San Francisco that I didn't think, I, at least I was aware of. And again, mm -hmm. so it just leads to a study. Um, I've gotten a chance to spend a lot of time in New York. I'm from Toronto, which is sort of like New York light. Uh, I love cities. That's what I do is I walk around cities and I draw and paint. And uh, I was in New York doing location scouting for Spider-Verse, taking thousands and thousands of photos that would be inspiration. And when I got home, I just started doing them as a way of reliving the trip. Um, I love all the details and the complexity, the gum that's stuck on the ground, the graffiti everywhere. You know, I'll always find a place for graffiti. But what, what's really artwork. striking when I saw your, or when I see your drawing is if you look at it closely and you've got a big screen and you can enjoy every de detail, like paint stuff and everything. But if you look at fast, like I'd say Instagram, like I, I'm just scrolling and scrolling, everything looks like photos, but better. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> the, the approach, my goal with these studies is they should have, be photographic in nature mm. um, and yet simplified. And how can I simplify the reality on screen in a painting so I don't have to paint every single little detail and yet give it that photographic quality? And so when I'm telling everybody, oh, do studies, do studies, do studies, learn how to paint photo real, then you'll learn how to reduce in complexity and then change in stylized materials, stylized lighting and all that. Um, my first time in Amsterdam, I, I loved, there was just these bikes absolutely everywhere and the difference is stonework and the, the bricks versus the sort of terracotta style and and just the, the graphic nature and the patterns on patterns became really fascinating to me and the quality of light. Again, it's, it's just the things I'm drawn to. I'm I'm not just taking the photo and walking away. I'm taking the photo, I'm doing the drawing, I'm wanting to understand why is it that this thing interests me and, and understand what it is so I can reproduce that sort of on demand when I'm called upon during the production of a movie. Uh, I recently you know, moved to Los Angeles and realized, oh my God, there's a totally different quality of light here. When I first went out to Newfoundland, I brought my paints with me and realized I didn't need certain colors Mm -hmm. um, because they're like all the blues are very, very cool. It's the North Atlantic. Well, it's the opposite in California. It's very warm and rich with these sort of sun-baked yellows. And everybody in LA's house is a different color. And people leave their cars outside forever because it never rains. So things mm -hmm. are always sitting outdoors. It, unlike Canada, where the outdoors is, is a threat, in Los Angeles, it's just sort of part of your house and it's always an extension. So I, I really fell in love with just the old cars and the sun faded. Look, it's something new to me and so it's something I wanna explore and understand. Um, I end up painting a lot of trash as a result um, because I just find it fascinating the things people are leaving outdoors. I don't know if they don't pick up trash as much in Los Angeles mm -hmm. as they do in Toronto where I'm from, but um, there's always, fascinating things to paint. And again, it's just allowing yourself to be curious enough to stop and take the time. You know, you stop and smell the roses, I stop and smell the trash. <laughs> That's nice. So you come from the toilet and then you go back to the trash. <laughs> exactly. We're good there. Ivy says like, I thought this was a photo uh, a little bit mm. earlier. And Valder Leonardo is like, oh my God, the amount of detail is incredible. Mm. So the detail, and we'll get into that in a moment, is um, a lot of it's implied. It's, there's, I have this sort of theory, what makes these images exciting to look at an app, you know, we'll take abstract paintings, like traditional abstract paintings that you'll find in a gallery. What makes them so interesting is the, it's, it's asking you, the audience, to, um, to take a step forward to it, to add your own interpretation, right? We're not just camera lenses, we are brains with lenses. And our brain is doing an interpretation of the image. And so what I've been trying to explore over the years is how little detail do I need to still trick the audience into believing all that details there. And I found the less detail I put into my images, the more enjoyable they become mm -hmm. because it's asking of the audience, all of you uh, in this case, it's asking your brain to do a little work and that <laughs> makes the brain a little excited, right? Yeah. There's, there's motivation in there, there is, uh, energy spent and it gets it starts getting you excited and when you look at the image it, you it's more than just looking at a photo because you're having to do some of the work i'm i'm putting some of the effort back onto the audience and that makes it enjoyable um uh, i've got x x toronto, x fan. toronto fan yeah who told me like who uh, would you force yourself to use a different style 
in your daily practice? I do. I do sometimes. Um, and especially while doing Spider-Verse work, I um, completely abandoned the computer for a while for what in the film we call Earth 42, that very inky style. And I went back to, I'd been doing years of just working on the computer. And I went back to just using black and white. Um, I had like a jar of India ink and nibs and brushes. And I would do studies, um, which I unfortunately don't have here because I'm on my little travel computer. But I would just do these kinds of studies uh, by hand uh, on scraps of paper, learning that inking style, using the approach that the artists would use um, if they were making that work for real or for Spider-Man 2099's world, mm -hmm. which for some reason is called Earth 928 and forever <laughs> is gonna drive me nuts. Um, that was very much like the industrial designers approach yeah. using like T-square and set square and very mathematical approach. So I would actually start all those drawings in blue pencil sketches, then use like a technical pencil, then use markers, then use technical pens, then I would paint on top. And for the film, and I will be showing some of these tonight, I have the different layers and we would actually give those different layers over the to the to the to the look dev artists yeah. and the and they would then build technology that would make it so we could see all of those different layers depending on um, focus and and what you know storytelling aspects of the film we needed. Um, I got a, yeah. a few questions here. Sure. Uh, Stuart Flicking says, do you work fast to not focus on any detail or overthink? Uh, I work fast because uh, I get bored quick. <laughs> so um, I like to, uh, but but I think there's something really great in that question is I try not to overthink the paintings while mm -hmm. I'm painting them. Um, I find a lot of artists um, tend to overcomplicate the process and think a lot. Mm -hmm. Am I making the right decision here? Should it be this? Should it be that? And often artists will turn in artwork that's sort of three or four different paintings match mashed into one and i always tell them like just give me three or four different paintings then um there's no we're not going to run out of canvas here especially on the computer in photoshop um just keep making more things so going with the simple statement going being deliberate moving through your painting quick uh for me helps me not overcomplicate my process and if i thought oh, I want to do this painting, but maybe the light should be over here. Well, then I'm going to do this painting and I'll do that painting and have the light over there or do it with different style architecture. Nice, nice, nice. And last question from uh, Ivy Johnson. Is the process from photograph or from sketch to get the photo realistic quality? Do you start from a photograph? Do you start from a sketch? Oh, well, uh, we'll very aptly timed question. We actually couldn't have planned that better because um, We've, we're going to do a little demo here, and um, I've kind of set it up how I would do a lot of this. Now, this isn't necessarily how I work professionally. We can see this screen now. Yeah. yeah this isn't necessarily how I work professionally. Um, you know, when I'm making new worlds and all that stuff, it's lot. I, I usually have lots of photos that I'm taking from as reference. Um, and of course, storyboards that I'm working with, direction from directors, color keys, and all that stuff. But when it comes to the studies, because I want to encourage people to do this stuff at home, I'll usually just set up something like this. I did manage to do this sketch on the airplane mm -hmm. here. Um, for, sorry, not the airplane. It was on the train because this was actually a photo I just took in London on my way to the train. And I really fell in love with the shape of this, <laughs> this stupid little English house. Um, and I don't mean that demeaning the English house. But... Uh, I did the sketch using a little trackpad so nobody would have to bother seeing that. But this is about how busy, uh, uh, complicated a sketch would be. There we go. And um, I tend to just line them up like this. And now I'm going to start painting this. And um, again, I'm not going to dive too deep into every single detail, but really try to capture the impression and understand when I say this stupid little English house, there's something charming, quirky about it. Um, but this photo isn't really exactly how I remember it feeling. Mm. They're always sort of just like a mental note um, and a good place to start. But I remember the day being a little more colorful, the angles being a little more wonky, a little more playful. I think um, my experience of it is different than what it actually looked like. Mm. And so I've sort of set up my canvas here. 
and I'll do my best to keep talking while okay. I start painting. Yeah, but I've got, I've got one question. Sure. When you said like you don't show us how you did the first sketch. Yeah, did yeah. You, did you like uh, layer it on top or did you draw? Next oh to no, it? I tend to just um, I've got them sort of next to each other, and it's okay. it's pretty dumb. But I just use the um, just the line tool. Or? Yeah, I love the 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 line tool here in mm. Photoshop, and let me I just grab black and I. I do the exact same approach when I'm, uh, there we go, there we go. Um, the exact same approach when I'm working in, you know, real life with a sketchbook, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll do a little better job of it than this, but, um, <laughs> and just sort of start breaking up my canvas okay. and finding oh. my angles. And really, I know once I get in there and start painting, okay. I will, um, start refining all these shapes mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Nice. But um, it's really just to break up the composition in, a, in an interesting way and knowing, you know, oh, that was the one. We, we were sitting here for a minute and I started practicing. We've been practicing. You didn't see that. Well, well, you have been. Yeah. We had some time to kill and I didn't know what to talk about, so I started. <laughs> so Ivy Johnson says, so no temptation to trace? Uh, oh, certainly I've traced. Yeah, mm. I've spent, you know, if I'm working on our deadline, I'm tracing the, the layout. Um, I am. I don't care. Mm. I All I want to do is, is learn. And if this is about learning the painting process, then I will do a simple tracing. I, I really don't care. I'll, I'll when I'm working professionally, I will eye drop the hell out of the reference image mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I'm here to learn, you know, and if yeah. if I'm struggling copying the image and it's not really a copy and an interpretation which is why i don't like to trace or eye drop too much but it's all there to help and we're there to learn and so if i when i used to do still life painting a lot of still life painting as a student if i couldn't get the painting right mm -hmm. i'd often just rip out a scrap of paper and try matching the color and walk up to the apple or whatever mm -hmm. it is i'm painting and does this match oh what no what is it oh it needs a little more red and a little more blue something like that so um trace steel <laughs> photo bash whatever you want whatever is going to get you making more images no oh, that's great and uh, Im imaginary starts to be very precise she says i it he says i think it's in Bethnal green and i've seen the house before <laughs> is it where is it Bethnal green uh yeah. it was in i have no Bethnal, idea where that place is Bethnal green i was near uh i was staying in shoreditch mm -hmm. uh and walking mm, east Okay, Bethnal Green is around well, Victoria Park. So and I was shorted. Shorted is somewhere around here. I don't know, oh yeah, shorted is high here. Yeah, so might be. Oh yeah, might be. Yeah, good point. Uh, imaginary. Now your work is to send you the GPS. <laughs> yeah, so extra points. Okay, so um, just like with a traditional painting, I'll usually start. Uh, backwards to fore background to foreground. I love, um, one thing I find in digital art mm -hmm. is it's so controlled and so precise that I try to find some inconsistencies to give it a little more natural. So I have this little brush and I won't really get too big into my brush pack, but um, let me turn this off for a second. I have this, this brush and I'm sure lots of you know this, but for the uninitiated, uh, I have this brush that is uh, just has a little color jitter on it. Mm -hmm. Is this my color jitter brush? No, this is my color jitter oh, brush. Yeah. And it sort of replicates when I'm working on uh, a real painting with oil. with oil or even watercolor, I'm always acrylic. I'm always sort of picking up something else that's on my palette and it sort of infiltrates my palette, mm -hmm. but I find it gives it a little bit of naturalism. And so I use this on a lot of brushes. And for those at home scratching their head, if you come over into your brush settings, I'm just using a regular square brush that's flat and come over to color dynamics. You can just adjust the hue, saturation, brightness. There's an option, uh, Zach Retz, good buddy of mine, great painter. He loves doing it like this with all the jitter uh, I turn off the apply per tip and I just sort of get the brush strokes. Um, okay, so on let's let's hit this. Um, so I remember this being a lot more vibrant in the background. And so I'm going to pump up this color just a little bit more and get some nice sort of inconsistencies and graphic breakup. One thing I love about this image is the way this stupid 
<laughs> the poor, poor number one Gibraltar, Gibraltar uh, walk. You're not stupid. You're cute. Um, <laughs> I like how it's sort of thrust up into the space. And so I'm going to kind of bring a bit of that energy into the, the sky here. I noticed that I'm getting, a, you know, the sky tends to get lighter in the horizon mm -hmm. and darker above. I'm going to grab a little gradient here. Oh, yeah. that, that's not my normal gradient. Um, then let's just do it with a nice soft brush. I'll get a little soft spray painty kind of brush nice. haze there. I like using brushes with grain. I like using brushes that, again, just never feel quite perfect. So it feels a little bit more like an artistic choice is being made, even though it's the computer doing the hard work. <laughs> Come back to my... Not too, not too much. Not too much, not too much. No AI yet. Thank uh, imaginary says, do, don't you use a graphic tablet with pressure oven? Yes, you do. Yes, I am using um, a Wacom Cintiq. Um, Adobe was gracious enough to hook one up, as we <laughs> discussed last night, um, for today's session. I, I tend to, I use an iPad occasionally, mm. but when I'm working, I have a nice big Cintiq. I, I'm going to spend 18 hours on it a day. Yeah. Uh, it's got nice pressure sensitivity. Um, and it, you know, there's nothing, nothing beats it in my opinion. I'm not sponsored or anything. It's just, I, I remember when I was in college, I was like, if I could just buy a Cintiq, cause I never really got it good at using the Intuos. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just get a good, if I could just buy a Cintiq, I'll be in good shape here. Uh, and I could become an artist. That was my big fear in life. So I'm gonna, you know, work on these clouds. I remember the clouds being pretty fun. Let's see, sometimes I'll use like the lasso tool to find a, more interesting shape, anything that's going to just change my approach and be fun. I'm going to fill that in. One thing I love doing is grabbing a really painterly kind of gra uh, painterly brush. Mm -hmm. Look at all these brushes. I, I used to never use a lot of brushes and then um, suddenly <laughs> Spider-Verse happened and I needed to be able to paint in so many different styles and I started making all these different brush packs for the crew. Yeah, because every universe you say has its own references, but every universe has its own brushes, has its own colors, has its own... Yeah, its own, and its own kind of mark making. So a lot of times, without limiting the artists, what I do is I provide them with sort of a guideline of, of brushes and encourage them to, of course, always do their own bring their own, get to know the material. They're going to end up spending more time with the material than, than mm -hmm. I am because uh, it's their painting in the end. But um, allowing, giving giving them sort of a direction to go in and then allowing them to explore. <laughs> so I want these clouds to feel like they're off in the distance a little bit. So I'm going to soften the edges a bit. Um, get a little darker under here. I work with a lot of layers. Um, but I'm never too precious with them. I think it's a habit from when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I was learning how to become a matte painter and my matte painting friends that were teaching me were always sort of like layers, layers, layers. Always send me more layers. I was ghost painting as a matte painter mm -hmm. um, for people and they always needed lots of layers so they could go and change and fix and change my, uh, and, and reproduce parts and take them apart. And, so I encourage everyone to, that I work with, just give me lots of layers. I don't care if they're that organized, but the ability to, whilst making a film, edit artwork is very important. You know, on a film, once you're done your painting, it's not really yours anymore, it's the films. And so you want to give the film flexibility to, to make changes as they see fit. Because w w one thing that um, we can tell the audience, I don't know if they're aware, aware of that, is that you're working as concept artist, as a visual development at the beginning of the movie. Yes. And what you're doing is not just cute illustration. You're doing that to get used by the team, by the uh, all the production, the animators, everything that's involved after you. It's not... Uh, Correct. Yeah, it doesn't... And we're not making an art book. This is something I, excuse me, we had pizza for lunch. Um, <laughs> we're not making an art book is something I'm always sort of having to remind and, and I'm famous for saying around the, the team, 
um, we're making a film. Now we're going to make a gorgeous art book and the art book's going to be great. <laughs> and art is going to show up in the art book that is not really part of the film. And that is awesome. But ultimately our goal is to make a film that moves people that tells a story. Mm -hmm. And so that means as the production designer, a difficult thing, one of the hardest parts of the job, the part that would scare me most days was actually going to my art reviews with all these mm -hmm. incredible artists, the artists, artists I've, I look up to artists whose work I'm, I'm a huge fan of people that, um, young artists that are just like, got the most incredible style, older artists, a good friend of mine, um, artist named John Bell. He was the art director of uh, Jurassic Park. He oh. designed the hoverboard in Back to the Future too. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, that's him. Yeah. Nice. John Bell, um, nicest man in the world. We became buddies in San Francisco and I ended up hiring him on Spider-Verse. And I was like, oh, this is great. I'm gonna get to work with John. I love John. John's got such great energy. He's got the craziest ideas. Um, and he's got all this experience. He knows how to make films. It's gonna be really great. And then of course, and this will happen to some of you one day if you become art directors and production designers, then you get all your favorite artists together and sit them down, all the coolest people you've ever wanted to work with, have worked with, and you all sit down and say, oh, shit. <laughs> I have to give John Bell notes now. I've got to give Ian McHugh notes now. Oh, my. Peter Chan is going to be giving me artwork and I got to give him notes, not just to give notes, but to make sure, and this is the difficulty of being a production designer, Ultimately, what your job is, is it's like an art gallery. Mm -hmm. We're going to get all these awesome artists together and bring all this art into it. But I need to curate a particular show. There's a theme to this show. And so I have to occasionally tell people this is one of the nicest paintings I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I want it on my wall, but it's not going to work for the film because either the film pivoted or the emotionality is not there or we've discovered, you know, that it's there's something different about um now that we've seen a lot of times what happens on the film is you sort of see something thinking you were gonna this was gonna be the right idea and then it, the idea has evolved mm -hmm. and your understanding of the project has evolved and the emotionality uh, of what this scene is about and I love our filmmakers Phil Lord Chris Miller Joaquin mm -hmm. DeSantos Kemp Powers and my mentor and good friend Justin K Thompson. Um, they're always looking for that better emotionality, that better read. So we're not making artwork just to um, get it approved and put it in the film. Mm. What we're actually doing is exploring the film as we make artwork. That's crazy. That's um, maybe that's part of the answer to uh, Jill Schoenegger's question. She, Jill said, would you suggest to focus on improving first rather than focusing on building a social media audience? Say that one more time. I was trying to remember a shortcut that I don't think work, works anymore. This, there used to be this great shortcut that would turn your brush. Uh, oh, turn your brush and plus your own in, in creativity. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I say that again. I got so half of it, but I want to make sure. Do you focus on oh, there it is. first or do you focus on building a uh, uh, social network audience? Um, <laughs> these days, it's it's both. And I, I think I'm I'm not an old man yet. I think, you know, I'm getting there. <laughs> With every movie, I get a little grayer. Yeah, I, I can, um, can do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here's the thing. You can't just sit around all day and study. You need a job. You need connections. You want to make things. You don't need to be perfect to start making movies mm. or video games, whatever it is. You don't need to be perfect. You're going to do most of your learning um, on the job. I mm. recall getting out of college and, or I was still in college actually, and I just was like, I'm kind of getting bored of this. Mm. I would love it if I were learning more from real professionals in a um, professional setting. Mm. And so I was working on my portfolio and kind of getting it out there at that time it was more like blogs and websites than social media. Um, but I was making connections already, even though I didn't have the best work possible. And in fact, um, that mentor, Justin, I mentioned, I met him, I think, eight years before we actually worked on Spider-Verse together. Mm -hmm. But I met him and um, he saw my work and he gave me some feedback and said, good luck, kid. Uh, I'll catch you later. What's going on here? Uh, good luck, kid. I'll catch you later. Stay in touch. And um, 
I remember this was like Twitter was just sort of happening or X as our friend would, <clears throat> would say. Um, and he started following me on Twitter and I was like, oh my God. And then 10 years later, I quit my job making video games and moved to Los Angeles in hopes of finding a job. And Justin had reached out to say, hey, I think this, this would be a great fit. I got a cool project for you. Um, why don't you come on down to Sony and we can have a chat. Mm. And so making those connections, even though I wasn't ready, was totally right. And as as I know now that I've done a few of these things, it's uh, <laughs> this is a great. I think I would. Yeah, do, do, Justin's do, got a lot of great photos. Do, do, do I share this or do I find a, a website of this? Um, I don't think he has a website. Everyone's just on yeah, Instagram you're, you're, you're now. I'm going to Google his name. Yeah. Um, as I know now, there's lots of artists who I meet and follow and chat with that are like 22, 16, that are pretty good mm -hmm. for their age, but still have a ways to go before they're going to become, you know, of the of the quality, I guess you could say, that's ready to work on a big feature film. Mm -hmm. um, I don't hold it against any young artists for reaching out and asking for feedback and connecting, even if their work isn't quite ready. How are we going to get ready unless we we learn and share our work? I think that answers the question. I hope. <laughs> Stuart said this whole game is about networking. Sort of, yeah. Um, in the sense that if I don't know who you are, how am I going to hire you? Mm. So there is an aspect, certainly, of getting your name out there, but um, I'm not hiring people because they're just my friend or um, because we've networked. I, I spend a lot of time just on Instagram. That's my favorite form of finding artists, just discovering artists. And I think some people are often surprised and I'm like, hey, I'm um, Patrick O'Keefe. I'm doing the new Spider-Man movie. What are you up to? Are you interested? Uh, they didn't network towards me, but I did find their artwork. And I think a lot of production designers and art directors are looking pretty deep. Um, mm -hmm. They're not just finding the popular artists. Certainly for me, I'm, it's not that I'm shying away from popular artists, but more so that I am um, looking for sort of the new voices, the new new ideas, because, of course, I'm on this journey to always be finding and showing off new styles of artwork. Okay. Mm, that's good. Since uh, Vasik says, uh, is it enough to apply for a VizDev position with five excellent artworks in my portfolio? Or should more be included, like color comps, mood painting, sketches, props? Um, great question. Um, Two, two, sort of two answers to that question. Five is probably not quite enough. We tend to look for 10. Now, I'm never going to um, choose an artist just based by how much work is in their portfolio, mm -hmm. but I tend to not need to see more than 10 images, and um, but I like to see at least 10 and a little bit of variety. Now, if you don't wanna do color keys, then don't put color keys in your portfolio. If you do not want to be a character designer, do not put character designs in your portfolio. And if you want to be a character designer, then maybe you should just focus your portfolio on that. Uh, I liken it to, I used to run a restaurant nightclub when I was like 20. And um, we had two people come in for a job and one person was like, oh yeah, I, I can, uh, I'd like to run the grill. Uh, uh, sorry, one person was like, I'd like to be a bartender. And the other person was like, I'll run the grill, I'll take the trash out, whatever. Well, I hired them both. The bartender became the bartender and the whatever became mm -hmm. whatever. And so it's good to be specific with what your goals are. Um, now, when you're getting started in your career, you might want to do whatever and just get in there. Um, it's good to then focus on, what did I do here? Okay, focus on um, what you really want to do and then show and you know i can do props and i can do color keys and i and i like doing that stuff too and i'm kind of happy to do anything but i really want to be a character designer can can i get um can i be a come a character designer for you so more than five images it's nice to round it out a little bit but be focused on what you're focused on is is the best advice show me what you want to do 
That's nice. Nice answer. So IV, I think you understand it best when it said like uh, what you're doing is like giving that team that come for that come later a framework to create from. Mm -hmm. or are your pieces actually used in the film? Um, some are. Some are definitely some are, and I do lots of drawing and painting that goes right into the film or is direction for the film. Um, most of the film itself, just so we're clear, is not painted, mm -hmm. but are three-dimensional spaces based off of designs and paintings that we have created. Um, but I still very much work as an artist drawing and painting throughout the production of the film. I'm one of the many artists on the film and I happen to be a production designer. So I'll also do big things like the comic book, uh, sorry, the art of book cover or the um, poster for the movie, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I relish the opportunity to get to do that stuff. Um, when my team is busy, I might take on projects. And I spend a lot of my time working with the artists and sort of editing their work and showing them how we can improve their artwork to hit the targets of the of the film. All right, how are we doing on time? I'm going to pick up the pace here. If you want. I'll do that. We still have a lot of time coming. I know I'm asking a lot of questions for you, but I'm asking the audience questions, so I think it's important to get them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Imaginary says, uh, imagine someone is producing a great artwork and there is a change of scope of brief or, or whatever. <laughs> how does the, how often does that happen? And how do artists get over the frustration? They don't. They don't. Um, <laughs> it happens all the time. As I said, the filmmaking process is sort of the film discovery process. Mm. We are constantly discovering as we are making the film what the film is and needs to become. And so it happens all the time. What I ask of my artists is to love your artwork while you're making it and assume it's going to be the perfect piece of artwork and fall in love with it and and it's magical and it's great and it's just going to be the best thing ever then we will put it up on the wall and it's no longer your piece of artwork it's the film's piece of artwork and we're going to judge it for its validity in the film and sometimes it's what we learn and sometimes it's what we we learn that we like sometimes what we learn what we don't like mm -hmm. it's all part of the learning process what i ask of the artists and tell them is like it's not your job to get your artwork approved. Mm. Uh, that's my job, <laughs> is to give you the right direction and get the artwork approved and looking right and, and the right stuff for the film. Um, it can be frustrating, but your goal as an artist is, again, just to continue that conversation as to what the artwork and the film should look like. And the sooner we can all sort of abandon the point the scorekeeping mm -hmm. of whose artwork got into the film, the better the the better we are as filmmakers. Okay. Um, I know some artists who've worked on films and they're like, oh, I didn't get I, nothing I did really got into the movie. And it's like, well, that's not true. Every idea you did got us closer to that final idea. Um, there's no no reason to to think you had any less impact than somebody who who then did the next painting after the 50 you did and now it's in the movie it's all we're all part of the same group of people mm. and filmmakers trying to make a movie so your, your role as a production designer is also to keep people motivated at the work and understand that and yeah more so than i expected um there's a certain amount of therapy going on on any production that i think everybody is involved in artists art directors production designers directors producers we're all asking ourselves to create something we've never seen before never uh, imagined before mm -hmm. um it's difficult there is a lot of um criticism of people's work it's it's creative criticism it's feedback and yet it's still difficult you know you make something you thought's amazing and it comes back and it's not right or it's not what you thought it was and mm -hmm. and that's difficult but what i want excuse me from my artists is to just 
feel confident that they are making something important and making sure they're making something they like. And I, I, I constantly reminding all of them and all of you who get a job, mm -hmm. um, you're there for a reason. And it's not just because you can draw and paint, but for who you are and the skills you have, um, that's what's important to us as filmmakers and, and your taste. Mm -hmm. So you're there to bring your personality um, to the to the film. And it can be difficult, uh, it can be challenging, but it's something that we all grow and, and do together. Now doing it over COVID was a certain extra <laughs> amount of fun um and stressfulness i think everybody was sort of having a mental breakdown mm -hmm. during covid and then do that while trying to make a movie nobody's ever seen before and it can get quite um stressful yeah because the first movie was out in 2019 uh 27 christmas 2017 so it's like 2018 oh, really? yeah i thought it was 19 was it christmas no, 2018 I, I, I trust you, you were on that movie I uh, the last two years have been a blur <laughs> Uh, 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 so my wife and I were having this debate actually. Oh, 18, yeah, that's true. Maybe. Yeah, it was Christmas 2018. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, so it feels like 2019 because it came out like right at Christmas. Mm -hmm. I think most people experienced it the following uh, year when it hit streaming. I it was I kind of, the kind of movie where people were like animated Spider Man film, whatever guy. And then um, it came out and people were like, oh, man, OK, that's pretty cool. Um, I got to tell all my friends about it. One thing I do while I'm painting, for those paying attention, um, is a lot of times I'll just, for things like windows and details, I'll just kind of paint them flat. OK. And then uh, instead of trying to work the perspective in, and then I can go in and sort of like warp them and um, and, and find the perspective and give it a bit of a wonky angle and all that. Um, it's sort of like a, almost like 3D where I'm building independent mm. elements, um, but it just makes it easier because for something like a window, for example, it's like I just need to make everything rectilinear mm. and then I can, I can force the perspective in instead of trying to have to draw in that crazy perspective the whole time yeah because in the end it's uh, just like a few pixels to the right or to the left and it, and it feels balanced or exactly mm -hmm. and a lot of times i might get into a bit more detail but i'm going to take a bit more of a holistic approach mm. right now because we are in the hottest room in france yep <laughs> yeah, because nobody wants to forget it was summer just a few days ago yeah, it's finally starting to cool down. MD is saying great Christmas gift. Hmm. Not MD or okay. gift. <laughs> <laughs> Imaginary says, I was blown away when I saw it. I got glued to the sofa. It was completely different than the kind of stuff I would normally watch. And I love it. Oh, that's great. I thank you. I There's a lot of people who come up and say, you know, I don't like Spider-Man. Or animated movies or this, that, and the other. And then we'll say, but this movie, you know, made a great connection. I made a connection with this film and it sort of changed my perspective. And mm. my thought to them is always great. Now go watch some more, <laughs> go support some other cool <laughs> things that you might not normally be, um, you know, attracted to, mm. might not be normally in your sort of repertoire, in your save list. Your Get out of your comfort zone. E even for curiosity, like uh, curiosity, you should see so many things around. Do you get inspired? And you don't only get inspired by uh, comic books or no, no. It's um a lot of a lot of I I look for inspiration anywhere and everywhere. I'm selfish in, in that I don't have any rules as to where my inspiration comes from, um, and I'm constantly. Just buying books, um, by uh, looking at architecture, I get a lot. I get more inspiration from I think architecture than I do mm -hmm. um, comic books. Uh, I get more inspiration from films mm -hmm. than I do concept painting. I look at a lot of um, photography, fashion photography for color, especially. The, uh, there's an artist I work with, Dave Bleich, 
um, who does a lot of our, my, will do a lot of color exploration for the film. And he showed me, he gets a lot of his ideas just looking at um, fashion photography. Oh. Fashion photography is very experimental in its color and lighting mm -hmm. because it doesn't necessarily, it needs to tell a story sort of just in one image as opposed to a film that has all this bandwidth to tell a story. So fashion photography often is, you know, remove the model in your mm -hmm. mind's eye and focus just on the colors and you're going to get some really interesting exploration and it's very... It's quite avant-garde art for the the time. I think fashion photography is some of the more creative work mm. being done these days. Yeah, we've got uh, Karen T. Webster who joined oh. us online. He says it's great to see Patrick doing his thing. Looking forward to tonight. So just to remind people who were not there yesterday that Kyle did a one hour session with us. That time it happened in French. You are used to follow him on his uh, Creative Cloud uh, Adobe Live uh, sessions in English or maybe on his YouTube channel. And if you happen to listen to French and to understand that, or if you want to just read subtitles, Karen was mm -hmm. there with us yesterday and he gave a great masterclass of how you can use um, brushes on Photoshop and which ones are going to be best for comics or for manga or for bande dessinée for the French ones. And uh, you might appreciate that one. That was really great. Yeah, very much looking forward to tonight. Mm -hmm. I think uh, somebody says, can't wait to welcome you there. And it's Patrice from EMA. <laughs> <coughs> Be because uh, as I reminded to everyone at the beginning of the session, tonight is uh, the same event is happening with, uh, it's a sold out event. And, uh, oh. By the way, maybe the, to now, just mm. right now, might be a very good time to start maybe a giveaway. Oh. What, what, what do you say about a giveaway uh, that would give you a seat to just watch tonight's session? The only thing I want to be sure is if you participate in the giveaway, there's going to be one easy keyword, which is in which city this event happens so if you want to just play with the chat you can un answer any other city uh, any wrong answer doesn't win but if you are today in Paris and you want to enjoy the enjoy the session then maybe you could just uh, type Paris and then we could see you just uh, I'm just gonna roll it in like maybe five minutes so if you type Paris now then you get a chance get a ticket for tonight yeah it'd be great if whoever won actually got to come <laughs> and wasn't in uh, St. John's Newfoundland unfortunately for my dad neither there neither in New York where yeah. Patrice comes from and uh, yeah we're gonna see if it's working if people want to get tickets everybody's speaking English maybe we don't have any French audience right now do we, ha do, do we have French people do we have people mm, in Paris that want to come with us Oh, Kiko wants you to come to Tokyo. Mm, I would love to go to Tokyo. That's one place I have yet to be. Um, and I would love to go for an art thing. Because the great thing about traveling uh, mm. to do these talks, of course, is I get to meet other artists. And we get to do things like this. And sort of, instead of just being a tourist, I get to be a bit of the art community and meet all these incredible, talented people wherever I go. Mm. Okay, and finally, oh, one more thing, and then we can get to the nice, stupid, <laughs> <laughs> the the beautifully unique <laughs> Gibraltar walk. Let's get this in there. And, you know, going back to what I was saying about motivations versus inspiration, um, again, I'm not trying to make the most beautiful thing in the world. I'm just trying to understand almost subconsciously what is going on in this painting and, and learn the materials and the lighting of the space. And um, again, I'm not making beautiful artwork. I'm just here to practice. This is like going and doing push-ups, which I should mm -hmm. definitely be doing more of in my life. Everybody should. Yeah. Everyone do a push-up. 
It's hot enough in here. We don't need to. We're, we're yeah, losing calories. Like, yeah, yeah, this is today's sauna day, so we yeah. can enjoy that. The Schwitz in here, it, which is great because we're burning calories while we paint. <laughs> um, so just sort of working the painting, uh, the study, hmm. you know, it's a study. That's all it is. I'm studying what I like about this thing that I found fascinating. And what I like is it's, as a personal note, it's sort of transporting me back a little bit to... Um, to last week when I was in London, mm -hmm. walking around and sort of stopped and saw this thing that I that I really wanted to to just understand better. Well, we got a proposition here. We got MD O'Keefe that says, mm, "What time does it happen tonight?" So I said, it's "7 p.m. in France." Yep. I said, "Good luck because it, there's no live stream." And he says, "Oh, you know, Concord is still working." <laughs> <laughs> Last I checked that, I couldn't fly into Newfoundland anywhere from, unless I was already in Canada, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can catch a boat. So here, you know, I've got this great brick texture. I don't want to paint, let's get rid of these tools. I don't want to paint every single brick. brick. Uh -huh. That would kind of be annoying. and it. That's yeah. not really what it felt like when I uh -huh. saw it. I didn't. You, you didn't mm. really feel the bricks. You didn't feel the uh, the the, the lights uh, striking there, and uh, it it was different. It was all about impression impressions. Yeah, all about the impressions, and and I was more attracted to the aging of the brick mm. than the the brick itself. Um, and so instead of painting every brick, I'm just going to go through and give it this sort of rough quality. That's what I really enjoyed about this. It, mm. it felt older than the buildings around it. And so instead of painting every brick, I'm just gonna imply all this detail. Um, and then what I could do is grab a you know rectangular brush here and put a few bricks in. Couple different colors. Oh, we've got a question from Nikki who says Patrick never gives a name on his layers. <laughs> uh, I do at the very end. I don't bother while I'm painting. Uh, I'd rather just kind of keep painting. Um, but when I'm ready to, when I finish a painting, I will organize it sort of background, foreground, midground, mm. um, the building, you know. Um, because, because you painted like clouds behind, you painted the house behind, what could be seen if we are hiding some of the layers. And you could get some perspective from that or some paradox. Yeah. That. So right now we have, you know, our little line drawing, which I always Keep mark in red. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we have our sky. So I would keep that and probably keep the clouds. Um, the ground is good. Oops, let's make sure we can see everything. You know, this could become one layer with this now. Mm -hmm. These lines, I might still want to adjust those. So uh, I'll turn those into one layer, but keep them separated. These background buildings, um, I did already crush them down into one mm -hmm. layer. One only one plan? One, one layer, plan. yeah. And that's my background, and now I have my big building here, mm -hmm. and my little fence in the foreground. Nice. Um, if I were doing this for Spider Verse, let's say I would probably have more layers than mm -hmm. I need because it's it's better to I'd rather it's easier to crush layers than it is to bring them back. That's for sure. Um, it's not something I am obsessive over, but it's something I'm just sort of mindful of. But there's nothing worse than um, having delivering a painting and then having your art director, production designer, or in my case, this matte painting lead come to me and say, oh, we love that painting you did. Um, can we get all those layers from you? And then you not having any. Mm -hmm. It just sort of slows down production. Yeah, because you're, you're not making art for painting. You're making art for the production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I always encourage the artists, don't, I, it's not even that you have to have like a really great method, mm -hmm. just options, just give me options. And yeah, it's nice. I mean, my favorite artists, the ones that get all the, that I bring cookies 
to the <laughs> studio are the ones that label um, their artwork. Anyone who's ever worked with me knows that <laughs> if you really want to win me over, it's uh, okay. layers with labels I'm, and I'm contact good. sheets with numbers. Oh, and yeah, we don't do cookies anymore. At the, <laughs> at the end of Spider-Verse, the lighting team knows I like Kit Kat, you know, candy bar. And uh, they would leave a bowl of Kit Kat candy bars in the lighting room. And I put on 10 pounds just from lighting reviews. And I, <laughs> But they knew, it, they knew it always gave me energy and made me happy. So they were... Yeah, so you're happier when you review and you yeah. say everything is nice. Everything's great. Great work, everybody. These are great. Delicious, delicious, delicious lighting there you got. <laughs> Don't put your chocolate hands on my screen. Yeah, it took me a while after the movie to be like, Wait a minute! I should. I'm eating like four chocolate bars a day. <laughs> what? What am I doing? I can't do this. I gotta, I'm a grown up, or at least I got to pretend to be like one eventually. I've got a question from Antoine Losty, which I already received here. He says, Patrick, what would you say to an artist in animation and game industry that is a bit too perfectionist and has fear of doing bad and he struggles to begin the work? Mm. And he said, it's not for him. It's just for a friend, you know. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Um, that's where this, these sort of, I would recommend, whoops, um, these sort of studies because they're not for anybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to post them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You don't need to become, you know, a, a famous artist with them. You're just doing studies and there's no perfect study. Mm -hmm. There is just studying. Um, nobody's struggling to start reading a page and thinking they're going to read it wrong while well, I'm just drawing and painting. I'm not worried about doing it wrong. I'm just worried about, am I doing it enough? Am I learning? And so just, just sort of pick it up and do it and don't worry. Nobody ever needs to see it. It's not going to be bad. Uh, and if it is, you can, it's fine. Nobody ever has to look at it. And we can ask if there was a chance of Patrick coming to Brazil. Oh, there's another country I would love to visit. Hook it up. Um, send uh, plane tickets. I yeah, start. yeah. Find a conference, Adobe Brazil, uh, and I'm there. Imaginary asked if you what's your favorite flavor of Kit Kats? Are you a traditionalist? Or are you ready for the strawberry cream or matcha matcha ones? No, the strawberry. I'm a traditionalist. Anything else is a is a uh, you should, you should try matcha. an abomination on earth. Yeah, Every, everything with matcha is better. No, 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 no. That's a it, it's against God's will <laughs> to you, mess you, with you, the Kit Kat. You're, you're not ready for Japan again. That's no, fine. no. I'm a I'm a wuss when it comes to. Oh, I like I likes what I likes. I paint trash and I eat trash. <laughs> you become what you eat. Yes, exactly. You become what you paint. Yes. So I had a question from Jill Schoeninger who said, like, any tips on how to get the first job straight after uni? If you mm. live in a different country than where you want to work, because uh, Jill says, I'm a little worried about not being able to make it into the industry, just to get inside. Mm. It, uh, it is... It is tough. You know, I was ready to drop out of university because I got my first job um, at an animation studio mm -hmm. one summer. And I'll we can, I'll go I'll backtrack in a second. And um, if you want to live in the United States or a lot of other countries than the one you're in, you do. It is very helpful to have a degree. It's the only time I'll really, really praise the having a degree mm -hmm. because um, you basically need to be able to prove to a country, another country that you are good at what you do and that they countries are stupid. Not unlike this house. Um, and they, they won't look at your portfolio. Oh, okay. The country of the border guard is not going to look at your portfolio and grant you a visa. Mm -hmm. um, so that piece of paper can be very helpful. Getting your first job in the industry is tough, and it's the thing a lot of people have a hard time sort of telling people how to do it because um, it happens differently for everybody. For me, um, I was working and living in Vancouver, British Columbia, mm -hmm. um, and I was going on Craigslist at the time, and there was a lot of like small independent films being made. 
and I would hit them up and say, oh, you know, they would be looking for storyboard artists, they'd be looking for concept artists, mm. things like that. And that just got me practice and helped me build a portfolio. Mm. And then it's just knocking on doors. When I was getting ready to graduate, I made a list of every animation studio and film studio and game studio in Vancouver mm -hmm. and um, just started applying and just sending emails, not even applying for jobs, but I would look who's the hiring manager, um, who is the art director and just sending emails with my artwork. And, you know, I get hundreds of these now mm -hmm. and ignore a lot of them, unfortunately, um, because I'm busy. Um, but it's a numbers game. You're just going to reach out to anybody and everybody and just keep knocking on those doors. Now, a great place to start, um, and I got a good start in in the advertising world. Why the advertising world is a great place to start is they make lots of commercials. They have so many commercials. And what tends to happen is um, somebody like me who is, you know, further along in their career than let's say whomever we're speaking to right now, uh, you, you may be way more advanced than me. It was hypothetical. Okay. And um, all I did commercials for like eight years and then eventually it was like, okay, I'm done doing commercials. I'm, I'm making a feature film. Hmm. And that animation studio that I worked with a lot, it's called a Hornet. Um, whoops. Um, just one second. Let me do this trickery. Um, called Hornet. Mm -hmm. uh, they would call me and say, hey, man, we'd love for you to come do this commercial mm -hmm. with us. And I would say, oh, you know, I'm making movies now. I can't really do it. And this happens all the time. And then they say, is there anybody you recommend? And it's always usually people right out of school. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they become these like mills, you know, mm -hmm. these factories of young artists that are starting their careers. They don't pay quite as much as feature films, which is why a lot of people stop doing them eventually. Um, and you want to take on bigger, bigger projects, mm -hmm. but they're a great place to start. The thing that's great about them as well is um, you do lots of commercials. You know, you can do five commercials in a year if, if you've got the clients. And what you're learning is sort of how do you start? How do you finish? Um, f making a feature film can take four and a half years, mm -hmm. like the last Spider-Verse. And as a result, you sort of do production one, pre-production ones, production ones, post-production ones, and then you're done. Doing commercials really showed me like what a production schedule is like, what it's really like to make these things because um, you're doing it so often and they're, they're basically like little short films. Hmm. Uh, these places are very hungry for new artists. They have lots of projects. I think they're also very attractive to younger artists because they tend to um, save some of this window pattern for later. Uh, they tend to um, have new ideas, maybe new ideas and are very flexible mm -hmm. in work. Like I am at the point in my career where if I get a call on a Sunday night saying, hey, can you work Monday? Are you available Monday to make a commercial for Amazon? And I'll say, no, I'm, I'm good. Um, but when I was 24 mm. and got the call, I was like, yeah, I'm going to yeah, any, any, when do you want? I can start right now. Don't worry about it. I'm already in my pajamas. <laughs> um, and I think it's that hungry, younger attitude is mm. well suited for that situation because you're going to do whatever it takes to get that gig. So no more answer Paris right now. I have a few users. If you are French, si vous êtes français, si vous êtes à Paris, oh, that's a good trick. Venir ce soir, je vais faire le tirage au sort. I'm just gonna pull the last ticket. Are you ready? Paris, everyone, did you answer the ones who wanted to come tonight? I got a few of you and the ones who didn't answer. It's, it's gonna be too late in 20 seconds because nobody, you don't know it yet, but we have 30 seconds delay. So when I say something, people have got 30 oh. seconds to think about it. And sometimes they completely miss it. That's why I did it. So you've been French. editing out all my swearing and everything. No, 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 that's not how it works. <laughs> Everything you say, 
He's nice. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, everything I say is on screen. It is being heard around the world. Oh yeah, all around the world, especially in Newfoundland. Yeah, all of Newfoundland <laughs> is here and listening. They do. There's yeah. a disproportionate amount of people in Newfoundland that like Spider Verse. Oh, no, that's true. That's true. Okay, I'm putting it right now. Roll it. And the winner is Panda's Creation Station. Panda's <laughs> Creation Station. I don't know who you are. But if you happen to contact me uh, directly from my name, from my email, from uh, my handle on Instagram or whatever, just give me a call, just uh, tell us something so that you, we have a chance to exchange with you. Hey, congratulations. Awesome. Congratulations, that's great. Uh, Antoine still has a small question right now about mm. do you feel the animation industry is a bit locked for character design jobs these days? Um, locked. And by that, do you mean like the style or that the people doing it are always getting the jobs? Mm. Let's, can we get uh, a how, clarification? How, how can you get insight? I guess. Um, do, do you think it's like too many, too crowded? No, I don't think it's too crowded. It's certainly the more popular mm. um, aspect, I would say, of a lot of people want to be character designers. Mm. Um, and so as a result, you have a lot of competition. Um, but what is great is a lot of films, the, the design, character design world sort of the tolerance for new and and different character design i think is ne hasn't never been greater mm -hmm. and so i actually find when i'm looking for artists um i tend to look overseas i look in europe um, just because they're not doing the traditional um or i'll look in a lot in asia or africa's got some really great designers these days they're not doing sort of the standard operating style of Pixar and DreamWorks and um, Disney. And so a great way to differentiate yourself and break in is not try to be the best at what everyone else is doing, but trying to do something new and different. Um, that will make you stand out uh, in that crowd of so many artists that are, are doing, you know, the same sort of Disney style. And there is a hundred thousand artists in Los Angeles mm. trying to do that Disney style. And that's great. Great for them. But a way you can distinguish yourself is be different and, and sort of be unique to who you are and your experiences. And that's what, yeah, at least, you know, in the world of making spider verses mm -hmm. uh, and the types of films Sony is looking to make these days, that's what, that's what we're looking for is new and unique voices and so it'll help you get seen mm -hmm. so yeah you, you can complete it i mean we can't find too much too many opportunities except in few big companies mm. that's why and uh, jill shanagar still has like uh, would an illustration degree be enough for an animation job uh i started as a illustration student Um, mm -hmm. The only reason I stopped studying illustration is I dropped out of that art school to chase a girl uh, who you met. That's my wife. Oh, it oh, worked. And, and that girl. Yeah, it worked out. Um, and the new school I went to did not have an illustration program, so I took a film design program instead. I always wanted to do film design. I just never really wanted to be an animator. But the real answer to your question mm -hmm. is um, it's less it's it's all about your portfolio nobody uh, certainly not me i guess i can only really speak for myself <laughs> but uh, i do not care if you went to school where you went to school what you went to school for mm. um one of i would say the most brilliant painters um i had a chance to work with uh peter chan mm -hmm. um color an unbelievable color key artist gouache painter um in his spare time, fine arts painter. Uh, yeah, as you type in Peter Chan's Spider Verse, you'll. Oh, C I think it's C H A N. Oh, my God. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, everybody knows Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Peter studied furniture design. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <It doesn't, laughs> you don't feel like it. No, not at all. Because he also 
doesn't really have a lot of structure in his work. It's not very mm. designy, but I'm pretty sure he studied furniture design at RISD um, in America mm. and is now like, you know, you want color keys. Yeah. You go to Peter. Uh, and that is so different, but I like to think something in in that transition made him a unique artist. Mm. So no, you don't have to do anything. You know, Dave Bleich, I think, studied fine arts. Mm-hmm. Um, Will Coiner, who does a lot of our character paint, he, he did a master's of, of fine arts. Um, people aren't taking, you know, concept. A lot of people just aren't doing concept art mm. as a as a field of study. And for many of them, it's just it didn't exist or it doesn't exist where they where they. Um, are living and going to school. It's not, um, no one really cares what you (laughs) studied. It's more, what do you want to do? And I've almost started to get more interested in the people who um, did study kind of weird things. Uh If if I see your portfolio and I'm like, whoa, this is great artwork. Oh, she studied mechanical engineering. I'm like, that's Let's do it. This mm-hmm. is this is going to be great. Kat Sai, um, another great artist who is in Paris. How, how do you write that down? Because it sounds like it's Kat, uh, Kat K A T, and then a new last name T S A I. And yeah, you'll want a space in there. There you go, Kat Sai. That's fine. Okay. Um, Kat Sai, I think she oh, yeah. studied. Yeah, Kat. Kat's fantastic. Um, she just moved to Paris. Uh, nobody, nobody hit her up. I think she's enjoying a little break. Um, <laughs> Kat Sai, I believe Kat studied um, psychology and then eventually took some art classes. And I can't remember if she did a degree in art or if she kind of just was doing psychology and then said you forget it and it's shocking actually there's she's not the only artist on the team who like started in med school hmm. and then decided to become um an artist instead i guess it, maybe it's easier to be an artist than a doctor um <laughs> it's, it's dangerous a few a few responsibilities yeah yeah you know i knew um an art an person say to become an architect and they decide to become a set designer and they would always joke it's great because um if my sets in my an- the sets i designed for animated films hmm. aren't gonna f- come crashing down and kill people <laughs> that's true all right how are we doing on time look at what i found by the way oh there you go there are new graffitis on the board. No, oh, there is new graffiti yeah. since that yeah, photo. Yeah, your, yeah. your version has more graffiti than what's happening on Google Maps. I don't know who did all that new graffiti. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Uh-huh. <laughs> so here you can see sometimes I'll make these window patterns mm. and just sort of copy them over and over again. Uh, I don't want to... I can be lazy at times, especially mm-hmm. while doing a live stream under uh, duress. You know, we got to get this thing done. Um, and so I'll find little shortcuts there. I'm not going to learn a lot by repainting every single window. Mm. And so um, I'll copy those shapes over and sort of lock my layer. And that will enable me to uh, speed up my workflow a little bit. And those little tips and tricks that you pick up along the way. Then you're working under the gun. You got your jerk of a production designer breathing down your neck. That's me. Hey, we got to get it done. The deadline's soon. The movie's got to come out. Um, You've learned all these little shorthands and skills. You know, this is also a great way to master software. You know, I use Photoshop a lot. Uh, I use a lot of other software as well. And whenever I want to get better at a software, I just decide to do like a little study And that's good practice. Um, Instead of me being like, oh, I really want to learn 
Photoshop, but what am I going to paint? Oh, mm. well, I don't know what to paint. I got to come up with a good idea what to paint. You, you never get stuck. Yeah, you don't get stuck. It's like, let's just, the goal here is to learn the software and get better at painting. Who cares um, what I'm painting? I just need to be painting something. It's funny because I was wanting to become a vet and now I'm an artist. There you go. <laughs> My brother wanted to be a vet and is now an artist. Everything happens. Yeah, think of all the things we could have, the services we could have been providing to the world. Uh, but now we're all just artists painting <laughs> silly buildings. No, I, I just want to question by Antoine Bastille who said, Great, did you hire artists from Spider-Verse that were very far from the definitive style of the film, but that brought new ideas and cool concepts? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, one of my we were talking about this on the way to lunch one of the things i love to do because okay let me backtrack because spider-verse often is going to be a new style and um, mm -hmm. and films in my opinion should be striving for something new um very often there just aren't people doing that style that style might not quite exist and sometimes it does and i'll hire those people but actually what i've found is like cat size is a great example she's like really loose painter really expressive um loves to do color keys but i saw in cat she would make a great set designer and yeah. so i pushed her uh, a little bit to her chagrin in the beginning um to become a designer and i would train her on how to become a designer and i think what i look for is just artists with good taste and good sensibility and then i will um pair them up with styles that although they might seem foreign mm -hmm. to the artists themselves they are something i believe that they're going to be great at and i would love to see their spin on it sometimes if you hire somebody who does that style they're so versed in that style there's it's so natural to them that um they have almost started to do like a caricature of it mm -hmm. And if you give it to somebody brand new, they're experiencing it for the first time. It's yeah. like if I were to try to speak French, um, when I was learning French, it's like I was always speaking in like proper French where everybody was speaking in slang. Well, I want <laughs> because the, they've been speaking it their whole lives. But I want somebody to learn the language for the film. And usually that takes like a novice yeah. or an amateur in that style to do so. And by the time then they can you know, they say you can properly speak a language when you can tell a joke in it. It's like when they can then do start sketching in that style, then they've mastered that style and they can mm. teach it to the other artists. Oh, yeah. Is it better when you Always hit try safe. to get your first <laughs> job in the industry to have little variety in your portfolio or to dedicate yourself entirely to one category like environment or character mm. design? Um, again, it goes back to sort of that bartender versus mm. the it's uh, versus the I'll do anything. It's really whatever you want to do. Now, the person who has a lot of variety, there's a good opportunity for them to get lots of different jobs because um, mm. they can fit into a lot of different situations. Um, but if you just want to be a character designer and don't want to do anything else, then just just show me your character designs. Um, Show what you want to do. Show what you want to do and what you think you're best at or what you want to become best at. And that is what um, that is what will lead you to, I think, the happiness of making the artwork that you truly want to make. Mm. I think for a few years, and it did get me jobs, yeah. for a few years I did like a lot of photo bashing stuff for video games and it was cool and it got me a job and it got me to america which i wanted to do to get closer to hollywood so i could learn that and taught me a lot of great stuff but i didn't really like doing it and then eventually i um and it's just a personal thing i just really enjoy the actual act of digital painting more hmm. um and then eventually what happened was i was just like okay i'm i'm quitting my mm. job and I want to try doing viz dev more full time and okay. more painting and I you know what was happening is I was doing more like painting less photo bashing it wasn't looking as photo real as photo bashing ever will 
And uh, my art director was like, cool, but you know, can you do the photo bash stuff? And after a while, I was just like, I just don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> and so I, I stopped. Now, it, again, it got me jobs. Yeah. So it's hard to say um, I regret mm. not do I regret doing it or anything like that. It's all. It's part of a big and bigger process. It's part of it. Yes. Yeah. It's part of learning. And you're going to learn something doing any job. And I think I was just interested in doing any job and I was broke and I needed money. And so, which I think a lot of us run into, it's like, I want to be an artist, but I also need to make money. I got bills to pay. So don't feel like you're cheating yourself out of it, but work towards your goal mm. and what it is you want to be doing. <clears throat> That's nice. Thank you. Thank you for all those answers. I'm trying to check if I'm not missing very important questions, but I think I've answered most of the audience questions in the live stream. Mm. That's good. Great. Yeah. And I feel like this painting, you know, uh, it starts to look like a painting. Starting so, to look like something. You oh. can see sort of the editorial choices I'm making. Um, changing the angles of certain things. Oh, I'm missing that, uh, that, that little fun thing right up top. That's the key mm -hmm. to this whole building. Let's, let's hit it. Um, and, but sometimes this is, you know, about as far as I will take a study. Again, it's not about making the perfect painting. Um, it's about learning and exploring and understanding. And mm -hmm. it might just be that you know, what have we been doing? 45 minutes, maybe? It might just be that's all the time I had to paint. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to stress myself out. I got to I gotta give a talk later. So I, I want to make sure I get prepared for that and everything. Uh, but what I did is I got I got a few push-ups in. And I learned mm -hmm. a little bit more about drawing and painting. A little bit more about my tools. The fo In this case, Photoshop. I'll do these same things just with watercolor okay. uh, in, my, in my studio or... Uh, if I'm trying to learn a new media, just grab a photo from your travels and give it a try. Try to understand what it is about this thing that is interesting or the materials or anything, because mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter as long as you're doing the work. Yeah, 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 that's true. How much polish do you think is needed in a concept? Is it common in the film industry that directors can interpret sketches without needing a full illustration? Um, yes, it is more common than I think is than concept artists think. Um, and I really encourage everybody to work, always be working on your drawing skills because um, more often than not, what we're doing is just simple black and white compositions. Mm -hmm. This needs to be lighter. Um, simple black and white compositions instead of big finished paintings all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's what as a production designer I sort of respond to the most is just quick ideas. Then we'll eventually get to like some really cool looking um, finished awesome paintings. But in the meantime, it's about ideas. It's all about ideas. And directors are better at looking at images than I think the industry often gives them credit for. Uh, and I think too many people come into the job hoping to just do really fun, you know, really gorgeous finished paintings when really um, what I want is your ideas. We're just going to make lots of ideas first. Hmm, I understand that. So it's 37 right now, 38. Hmm. We've passed the 90 minutes spot. You okay. Know. It's good. <clears throat> I think people are enjoying. Uh, what are your favorite design books? Design books. Um, I recently got a book, The Encyclopedia of Brutalism. Oh, nice. Uh, it's a big, fat, red book <laughs> um, that I absolutely love. Um, lots of great stuff. I, 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 I got really into Brutalism recently. As you can see in the film, <laughs> this one, this one here, mm. yeah. Um, and um, there's another one on Soviet Union bus stops through mm -hmm. the ages. 
that I also really love. Again, I don't just look at artwork. I look at a lot of architecture. Um, I look at a lot of architecture as reference and inspiration. Mm. Which one, the red <clears throat> or the blue one? Uh, I got the red one. Oh, I didn't know there was a blue one. Oh, yeah. I've seen that. And then one of my favorite books, uh, but I'm trying to remember the name of it in English. Um, Type this in. It's a kid's book. Mm -hmm. It's Children of the Soviet Union. Um, Literature. Uh, Red squares. It's like two red squares. It's got a really like basic English name. Two red squares. There it is. The one with the big two. Okay. This is one of my favorite books of all time. It's a. So it's yeah. a Soviet era. Two where, two, two squares by L. Lisinski. Lisinski, yeah. L, uh, Eli Lisinski or L. Lisinski is um, this incredible graphic designer, hmm. and this book is about. Um, it's a Soviet propaganda book mm. about com like promoting communism. But that mm -hmm. aside, <laughs> it's just really nice graphic design. Oh, um, yeah. Looks like. Yeah. It's exposed at the moment, by the way. Yes. Yeah, I bought a copy. It's it, I bought more than money than I should spend on mm. a copy of that book. <laughs> just yeah, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. It was like two hundred dollars or something, which is a lot for a kids' mm. book, but um, it's a favorite. So, <laughs> all right. What does Antoine say? And everybody agrees. <laughs> it's how to find the right amount of craziness and originality in a portfolio and still have production work that sticks to the expectations. Um, it's true, but um. You know, you can cater your portfolio to do some more generic stuff, and that's great because the world is going to always need more generic stuff. I can only speak from my point of view, and I am always looking for the crazy uh, artistic ideas that set artists apart. But mm. not every single film is going to be Spider-Verse, so... <laughs> So I understand the difficulty. But uh, I'd say a lot of art directors can, you know, they're going to take the crazy cool, even if they're going to make like a silly commercial, mm -hmm. you know, like a Toyota ad or something like that. They're still looking for artists who yeah. are being artists. And to me, I can look past, oh, it doesn't quite fit with my project, but I mm. really like this person's style. Um, maybe I'll, I'll hire them, even though it doesn't quite fit, but I like what they're doing. I like their approach. I like that they're trying something different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How to in incorporate other visual mediums into my own work, like you did with comic books in Spider-Verse? Um, hmm. that is very, that's a very story for me. That's a very story specific question. Uh, what kind of story am I trying to tell? Mm -hmm. You know, if it's again, like with Gwen's world, it's a very emotionally fluid person and I want to represent the world in which she sees it. So I'm going to go with that watercolor. I mm. think that's a personal question. Um, what is it stylistically that will tell your story? Uh, what materials do you like? Mm -hmm. What are you attracted to? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're we're getting into a good spot here. Nice. Let's address it. How many times do you have to live with uh, subpar design because of limited time due to deadlines? Uh, um, thankfully, in the world of Spider Verse, almost never. Um, we put the quality and the of the work and the idea above everything else mm -hmm. and that is what matters the most and we are fortunate to have really great producers and a great studio mm -hmm. backing us up 
and um, never quite telling us like if if I'm passionate enough mm-hmm. to say you know I just I know we said this was done and we were happy with it but it's just not quite I think we left as. Uh, Phil Lord, our executive producer, would say yeah. he never wants to leave money on the table. He doesn't want to leave a good idea behind. And if we have a good idea mm-hmm. uh, that comes in a little late, then I know it's going to be tough and we're going to redo some stuff, but um, let's get that good idea. Like, I don't want to leave that hide. I don't want to leave that money on the table. Um, and the studio and our even all the way down to our production managers, mm-hmm. Jess Berry, our new line producer, and on the first film, one of our um, managing producers is like, she, she's going to find the time. You mm-hmm. know, if I'm like, Jess, I got it. We got to mm-hmm. change this. Everyone agrees it was great, but we got to do something bigger, better, bolder. The film has evolved. Then she's going to find the time and the money and, and, and mm. the wherewithal from the team and move things around. And that's what it is. We're not competing against each other her schedule versus the vision of the film mm. we're all filmmakers we're all filmmakers working together to make the best film possible it's not i was right you were wrong it's uh what 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 can we do to make this thing the best thing ever even if you are just uh not just but managing the schedule versus uh doing the artwork we're all mm. doing it together Uh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Always remember to hit save. Oops. Yep. Everybody does that. Yeah. How many of you forgot to hit save and regret it <laughs> instantly <laughs> after it crashed? Yeah. The by, the, second. by the way, it doesn't. It didn't, which is pretty nice. Yep. And don't forget that inside your Photoshop preferences, you can set up auto saving uh, auto saving time. And you regret it way less than necessary. <laughs> way, way less. Wow. So there we go. I'm feeling pretty good about this. Yeah. We got to get ready for the talk tonight. Yeah. Um, especially you. Because especially me after mm. sitting in the sauna <laughs> and in a <his> shirt. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, one thing, this will drive, this used to drive one of my um, coordinators nuts, but I do it. I love it. I always like to put a little, um, you know, like that contrail or whatever, the vapor trail from the airplane. Oh. I always like to stick some of those in my painting. So it just gives it some directionality. He'd always be like, what are those lines? They didn't make no sense. I hate them. <laughs> I'd always stick them in there. Now I must do it just to bug them. Do you, do you like to still be a little punk? Yeah. Hmm. I got to knock that down. More directionality. It was excellent, great painting as well. Thank really you. enjoyed it. Yeah, I, you know, I really, we, we were talking last night, what am I going to paint? And this was something I, I did a sketch of in my sketchbook, which I didn't bring today. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, I, yeah, I forgot my sketchbook today. It's back at the hotel. But this was a study I really wanted to do because I enjoyed something about it. And I think I understand now a little bit more. It's the collections, the shapes, and the graphicness. I, you know, a lot of people paint really dramatic, stylized light. Mm. I love just natural light. Helps me understand, you know, how to paint things in their natural element. Well, that's really, really a nice one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, all the audience, because you've been with us for like quite a long time now. You've been with us for like almost two hours. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's great. That's awesome because everybody stayed there. Everybody was Mm -hmm. like keeping the pace. Uh, Don't hesitate to share. Don't hesitate to subscribe. Be careful if you are, uh, beware if you are like not a French speaker. Usually our sessions are mostly in French. So there's also already an Adobe Creative Cloud uh, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. There's already the Adobe and uh, Photoshop different Behance live streams. Uh, But here we're on the YouTube from we're on the Adobe France YouTube channel. You can like, you can subscribe. Like is helping us a lot because it makes us want to invite mm. those kind of artists. Yeah, and th- thank you for having me and the big thanks to you, Frank, mm-hmm. for, for hooking it up uh, and taking care of me and running the session. Well, you're welcome. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Krico, Enrique, Antoine, Emma, Delphine, Stuart, MD, O'Keefe, <laughs> Nikki, Kid, Panda. See you tonight, Panda. Thank you, Jill, for your question. Natalia, everyone. Well, bye-bye. Au revoir. <laughs>